to the seminar on keys to governance, constitution, constitutional morality. We have a distinguished panel of speakers today. Professor Nirja Gopal Jayal, Avanta Chair, King's India Institute, King's College, London, and Sentinel Professor, Department of Gender Studies, London School of Economics. She was formerly professor at the Center for Study of Law and Governance at JNU. Then we have Professor Suhas Balshikar, Chief Editor of Studies in Indian Politics and Co-Director of Lok Niti, is part of CSDS, formerly Professor, Department of Politics and Public Administration, Sabitri Bai Pune, Pune University, Pune. Professor Christoph Jeffelot, Senior Research Fellow and Professor Seri, Sciences Po Paris and member of the CNRS Paris, Professor King's India Institute, King's College London, and Chairman Trivedi Center for Political Data, Ashoka University. Now, due to some logistical issues, Professor Jeffredot is not with us right now, but we did record him a few hours ago, earlier today, from Paris. And then we have Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court of India, Sanjay Hegde, who's uh, slightly unwell, but he's been kind enough to join us. Uh, yours truly, Suhas Borkar, shall moderate the discussion. This is the seventh edition of this seminar series on keys of governance in honor of my elder brother, Shekhar Borka, banana boy on the Indian postage stamp, private sector administrator, citizen environmentalist, and advocate of empowerment of persons with disabilities who passed away today in 2015. The earlier six seminars in the series, Keys to Governance, were on Compliance and Delivery, 2016, Political Will, 2017, Constitution as Ideology, 2018, Education as Empowerment, 2019, Steel Frame, 2020, <coughs> and Independence of Judiciary, 2021. Now to today's topic, constitutional morality. I think we would begin, I would just like to quote from uh, Baba Saheb Ambedkar's famous uh, speech uh, delivered <coughs> on the 4th of November, 1948 on the draft constitution. Now, uh, <clears throat> he quotes at great length the British political, radical, and classical historian George Grothe. I quote The diffusion of constitutional morality, not merely among the majority of any community, but throughout the whole, is the indispensable condition of a government at once free and peaceable, since even any powerful and obstinate minority may render the working of a free institution impracticable without being strong enough to conquer ascendance for themselves. Ambedkar goes on quoting <coughs> Grote. By constitutional morality, Grote meant a paramount reverence for the forms of the constitution, enforcing obedience to authority and acting under and within these forms, yet combined with the habit of open speech, of action subject only to definite legal control and unrestrained censure of those very authorities as to all their public acts combined to with a perfect confidence in the bosom of every citizen amidst the bitterness of party contest 
that the forms of constitution will not be less sacred in the eyes of his opponents than his own. Now, what explains the growing weakness of constitutional morality in contemporary India? How do we balance the competing claims of popular morality with constitutional morality? Is there a census possible on constitutional morality? These are, the, some, these are some of the questions which we will be taking up during this discussion. Um, now, uh, I would request uh, uh, Sanjay Hegde to take the floor and uh, begin the discussion. Sanjay? Is Sanjay there? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please, yeah, go ahead. I, I had to be unmuted. Well, that, yeah, that is also a metaphor for the times. Thank you, Suhas, uh, for inviting me to this webinar. And in, when we were talking about constitutional morality, through this webinar system, where you have to depend on somebody else to unmute you. You need permission before you speak. I think that is a very good metaphor for the times that we live in. Uh, Mr. Fali Nariman, in a particular uh, interview, narrated what, it wa what India was like in the days of the emergency. He saw two senior advocates in the morning before court began in the library of the court, Mr. C.K. Daftari and uh, Mr. S.T. Desai. Mr. S.T. Desai turned to Mr. Daftari and said, Chandu Bhai, Bolo. And Mr. Daftari, in his inimitable manner, tapped on his uh, pipe, look, uh, looked at uh, Mr. S.T. Desai and said, Sundarlal, Pela Tame Bolo. You speak first. So I, <laughs> just this accident of waiting to be unmuted set me thinking on those lines as to what exactly is constitutional morality and what is the morality, the context of constitutional morality that we need in our times. You see, it's almost 20 years to the day when a former prime minister of India told uh, then the chief minister, Aap, aapke raj dharm ka palan kare. and that is uh, also, in a sense, the word Raj Dharma, how is a Rajya, a union, a country to be governed? We, right from the days of the Mahabharata, where you must remember that Raj Dharma was preached by a dying Bhishma to uh, the to Yudhishthira, who was uh, soon to come into power, as to what kind of country what kind of a nation had to be built so that all the disasters of the Mahabharata did not again visit those people. If you look at how our constitution was framed, people very easily forget that our constitution was framed against a preceding decade of great violence. We, our founding fathers had the experience of the World War, the Second World War. They also had the experience of the Jewish Holocaust. There was partition violence in our own country, and there was the murder of the Mahatma. It is against this backdrop that towards the end of the, uh, of the 1940s, that we came up with a constitution which was to govern us thereafter. And have we exactly followed up on what, uh, what our founding fathers gave to us? Or is it uh, what, um, like what Dr. Ambedkar said, constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. 
we must realize that our people have yet to learn it. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. So as the years have gone by, as the constitution has worked itself out in practice, without saying that this party was responsible or that party was responsible, I think the greatest disservice that we have done to our constitution is to forget the context in which it was written. There has been a general inarticulate major premise among the majority that the constitution was just a mere document put together by somebody who was Western trained, who did not believe in the caste system, who in today's terms would possibly have been declared as anti-national by an IT cell, who in today's terms would have struggled even more than he struggled in the 1950s to have got elected. Because if you look at Dr. Ambedkar's life, if you look at the influences that he got together, that he melded and steered through the Constituent Assembly as chairman of the drafting committee, Dr. Ambedkar knew that he was dealing with, a, with an assembly which was 80% orthodox Hindu. And the president of the assembly, President Rajendra Prasad, was probably the most orthodox of them. And yet, they came to this magnificent constitution which has served us reasonably well over a period of the past 70 years. Now, you must also remember that our neighbors also set out to write a constitution. Pakistan set out to write a, uh, write a constitution, but it did not manage it until it was severed into Pakistan and Bangladesh. It was only the, the 73, in 73 after Bangladesh that uh, Zulfikar Ali Khan Bhutto brought in the Pakistan constitution. Otherwise, they went on through various orders and other documents, including the, gov the Government of India Act. So we have not necessarily, as a citizenry, imbued in ourselves a sense of reverence for the constitution of what it stands for and what it is designed to prevent. We have more or less thought, uh, uh, thought of the constitution as something that is written, something that will be quibbled over by men with long purses in the Supreme Court. That's, and that the constitution will actually come to somebody's a rescue, that it will reach out to the lowliest, the lost and the last, is essentially a post-emergency realization. That was when the Supreme Court reached out with public interest litigation and um, uh, got into the problems of many who could not actually approach the court. Now, what is constitutional morality as defined by the courts? There have been judgments and judgments. Like the, there is also a certain uh, unstated proposition that uh, constitutional morality is nothing more than the basic structure of the constitution, which shall not be tampered with. That once you had that doctrine in uh, in place in 1973, that you had a constitution which the court could declare that certain, certain provisions of it were so basic that they could not be interfered with. That was really the heart of the constitution. That was the morality of the constitution. And therefore, we, we, can, we did not need to look beyond the basic structure. However, the basic structure doctrine is not sufficient. The basic structure doctrine only is applied to constitutional amendments. 
it is in the day to day working of governments of institutions where governments and inst uh, where the people manning that particular post take it upon themselves to say that look we are here in this post constitutional law statutory for a brief period of time we have a brief lease on power and at that and that the only guide is the constitution if that is where every authority from the policeman to the prime minister were to apply that as a talisman would this be constitutional then i would then i would submit that we may have answered dr ambedkar's question you know one more uh, one more example of this very this understanding that power was temporary and it was to be exercised for the public good was given to me by justice santosh hegde who is not a relative of mine who told me what his father had said his father justice k s hegde had been uh, he had been a judge of the high court he had been a, a chief justice of the uh, high court a judge of the supreme court speaker of the lok sabha and almost became president of india he told his son look i have served in a variety of high offices but in none of them did i complete a full term never identify yourself with the chair do not think that you are the chair if you follow that then things will fall in place the day that you identify yourself with the chair that is when you are lost so coming back to raj dharma what is the dharma that will hold a country together and if you look at the very root of the word dharma the word the root word is dri dri, dri which means to bind dharyate iti dharma that which binds together is dharma this is a magnificent constitution which we have given ourselves it is not a mere book to be consulted after an emergency has occurred it is a book to be lived it is a book by which every authority in power for whatever period of time says that that is a limitation upon my powers and i will exercise my powers only in the manner which is authorized by it i can't think of a better example of um, uh, what constitutional morality uh, is then uh, to quote the former chief justice of india justice deepak mishra in narendra shishtal versus the state of maharashtra where he told people that those who act honestly are remembered kindly by history as their actions promote constitutional morality or ethical propriety he came back to the theme in manoj narula where he used the phrase at least 15 times and that was in a case which sought directions to the prime minister or the chief minister as to what kind of people to include in a, in their cabinet if people had a criminal record they should not be included again justice mishra said that constitutional morality means that one must bow down to the norms of the constitution both written and unwritten so it is that unwritten interstices of the constitution which cons which form its morality you can if you were looking for a crystallization you, you do not need to look much further than the preamble the pre the preambular goals do we advance those goals or do we not advance those goals 
the last example that I, I could give, and you know, if constitutional morality had been adhered to, and it's my submission that in this case it was not, was the CAA protests. In the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which as the Home Minister rightly says, is an act to grant citizenship. To grant or not grant citizenship to any kind of people is entirely in the realm of the executive. And it was suggested to the executive that by Mr. Subhash Kashyap, who's there on record, as saying that if you, uh, you, if you draft it in a manner that says that to the harassed minorities of the neighboring country, then it would be constitutional. But the executive of the day specifically decided to add only a few re uh, religions, people belonging to a few religions, and specifically exclude a major religion. There was an unconstitutional point to be made. And they made it. If they had adhered to morality, would we have seen all that followed? I do hope that whether you call it constitutional morality or Raj Dharma, whatever, you, uh, whatever phraseology you give, please inform yourself that your power is temporary. Your power is circumscribed by the book and that ultimately you are there for the welfare of the greatest number. Thank you. That, that, with that, I thank uh, Suhas once again. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will be switching off my uh, camera, but I will continue to participate. I'll come back for the question and answer. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Sanjay, in spite of your being unwell, you you were uh, you joined us. Now, um, before I uh, request uh, Professor uh, Niraja Jayal to come in, you know the, the 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 kind of scenario which is now before us that uh, you know what happened in Hardwar and uh, the call which was given for a genocide against uh, the Muslims. You know, and then the the state executive, the the central executive, and even the Supreme Court, not even doing anything about it. I mean, is that uh, are we living in uh, constitutional morality? I just wanted to uh, you know uh, page that in so, uh, before I requested uh, Professor Jayal to come in, Professor Jayal. I'm being muted. You have to unmute. Uh, yeah. I am unmuting myself, but I'm yep. getting muted yep. uh, by the host. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Borkar. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, you have framed the topic of constitutional morality as a key to governance. And this could be taken as suggesting uh, in, in a vein that Mr. Hegde has, uh, in fact, argued that the burden of practicing, of promoting, of preserving constitutional morality falls on those who are in positions of authority in the institutions of governance. But as you yourself said in your opening remarks when you quoted Dr. Ambedkar, in his usage of the term, constitutional morality was about the need to, what he called, saturate the public consciousness with constitutional morality, to cultivate popular sentiments um, that could sustain a democracy, and again, borrowing from Groot, teach the citizenry the balance between freedom and self-restraint. Um, three quarters of a century later, in the NCT of Delhi case, Justice Deepak Mishra, who, as Mr. Hegde said, used the term rather frequently in various judgments, he interpreted constitutional morality as requiring that all constitutional functionaries should what he called cultivate and develop a spirit of constitutionalism so that every action taken by them would be governed by, would be in conformity with 
a morality that inheres in, and I quote here, the constitutional norms and the conscience of the constitution, unquote. So constitutional functionaries can be assumed to be at least all those charged with running the executive, the legislature and the judicial, uh, the legislative and the judicial branches of government. From Dr. Ambedkar to Justice Mishra, we seem to have traveled rather a long way when it comes to answering the basic and fundamental question, which is this, on whom does the responsibility, the burden of practicing constitutional morality rest? For Ambedkar, it was the citizenry in which democratic virtues had to be inculcated. For Justice Mishra, it is those who govern, who need to act in accordance with the norms and spirit of the constitution. The question that logically follows from this is of course, where does recourse lie? when it is contravened or avoided or, or there is abstention. I mean, morality is a notoriously subjective concept. And since morality by definition lacks the force of law, who will decide if, when, and how to enforce this? And this speaks to some extent to the, to the comment you just made, Mr. Borkar, yourself. Now, in this context, much is often made of the conflict between public or popular morality and constitutional morality. And this conflict has been famously negotiated in two recent judgments. In Navte Johar, there was no disagreement that constitutional morality must trump popular morality. So constitutional morality here appears as an antidote to public morality to correct what the Delhi High Court in the Nas Foundation case had called the shifting and subjective notions of right and wrong in popular morality. There was also a sense conveyed by both these judgments that public morality is somehow temporary and fickle, while there's something stable, enduring about constitutional morality, and that is what makes it appropriate for the judiciary to try and transform society by intervening to convert public morality into constitutional morality. In the Shabri Mala case, on the other hand, we had a disagreement on this question. The majority judgment or judgments endorsed the idea that constitutional morality should trump popular morality, but the minority judgment held that India is a pluralistic society in which the state must respect the freedom of various individuals and sects to practice their faith, in other words, popular morality. And yet, there can be, and sometimes are, rare enough, but there are cases in which we might see a convergence between popular morality and constitutional morality, between, so to speak, the public and the constitution, with constitutional functionaries on whom Justice Mishra uh, uh, you know, laid the burden of bearing the responsibility of, uh, of practicing it, with constitutional functionaries being the outliers. Take the protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. It could be argued that in upholding the equal and inclusive conception of citizenship in the constitution, the citizen protesters, the public, were advancing an argument that was in consonance with constitutional morality, with not just the letter, but also the spirit of the constitution. They held aloft copies of the constitution, the flag, the national anthem, they did collective readings of the preamble, and all these are symbols of the constitutional order. But not just symbolically, even in substantive terms, they reaffirmed the principles of equality, of inclusion, secularism, democracy, and basically through an open challenge to majoritarianism. Above all, they powerfully enacted the largely forgotten ideal of fraternity in the constitution, which, as all of us know, was introduced into the constitution by Dr. Ambedkar, uh, who, who uh, thought of fraternity as another name for democracy. And, and for him, liberty, equality, and fraternity formed a trinity in which the divorce of any one of these from the other would defeat the very purpose of democracy. So as practitioners of fraternity, one could say that the public or civic consciousness that we witnessed in this movement was, in Dr. Ambedkar's own expression, saturated with constitutional morality. 
In a sense, then, the anti-CAA protests exemplified an unusual convergence of constitutional morality and popular morality. As for the constitutional functionaries, we know that the executive stonewalled and even punished the protesters, while the judiciary chose to privilege the convenience of commuters, even as it made nice noises about dissent being a part of democracy, so long as it's conducted in designated places. However, and Mr. Hegde alluded to this, the 150 or so petitions challenging the constitutionality of the CAA remain pending. The question is, when courts ignore constitutional challenges of this kind, where might an apparent breach or self-evident breach of constitutional morality find a remedy? Where does recourse lie? A couple of other points. In the anti-CAA movement, minorities, not only minorities, but minorities were in the forefront of reclaiming the constitution. And there's an interesting contrast here with George Grote, who as cited by Dr. Ambedkar and quoted by Mr. Borkar at the start, was anxious about powerful minorities holding free institutions hostage. For Grote, constitutional morality needed to be diffused, not just in the majority of the people, but in the whole citizenry, because he feared that a powerful and obstinate minority could make the working of free and peaceable institutions of government impracticable. But how should we think about this question in a majoritarian context, when the danger to free institutions emanates not from powerful and obstinate minorities, but from a powerful and aggressive majority? I mean, as an aside, one might recall that Grote was a contemporary of John Stuart Mill, who flagged his own anxieties about the tyranny of the majority in his uh, little book on liberty, which was written about just about a decade later. Another slippery issue is that of defining the soul or the spirit or the conscience of the Constitution of India, terms used by Justice Deepak Mishra in uh, the NCT of Delhi judgment. It is plausible that there could be as many views of this undefined spirit of the Constitution as many views as there are judges. As the lawyer and legal scholar Abhinav Chandrachur has written, if a judge holds that the soul of the Constitution mandates that India be declared a Hindu state, would we find it acceptable? Would we find it in consonance with constitutional morality? In a fractured polity, in a polarized society, even the constitution can become whatever either side wants it to be. The interpretation of what is explicitly written in the constitution is complex enough. How do we deal with the subjectivity inherent in the interpretation of something as abstract, as intangible as the soul of the constitution? I'm not aware if the nine judge bench that was constituted to pronounce on this did clarify the issue. But this is probably the kind of conundrum that the learned Attorney General of India, Mr. K.K. Venugopal, was referring to when, in the backdrop of the Shabrimala judgment, he said that it was possible for the court to speak in two voices, both justifying their com completely contrary positions by invoking constitutional morality. I mean, one could say that Constitutional morality demands the entry of women uh, into the temple, the other that it prohibits the entry of women. Now it is this that made Mr. Venugopal pronounce constitutional morality to be a dangerous weapon. And I want to quote from the speech he gave in December, 2018, when he said, the use of constitutional morality can be very, very dangerous. And we can't be sure where it will lead us to. I hope, constitutional morality dies, unquote. This is an ominous prognosis and an even more dire hope to entertain. Um, for reasons I can't begin to guess at, obviously the prognosis seems to have become an accurate prediction because we've heard little about constitutional morality in recent times. So can constitutional morality be a key to governance? If we go with Dr. Ambedkar's conception of constitutional morality as an attribute of citizens, we find an ongoing contestation between a section of the public that has deep faith in the constitution and another section of it that subscribes to ideas and practices of hate and violence miles removed from the constitution. 
if we go with Justice Mishra's conception of constitutional morality as an attribute of constitutional functionaries, maybe we could set the bar much lower and just settle for constitutionalism and constitutional propriety with or without the morality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you have uh, broadened the entire uh, discussion. Thank you. Now, uh, can we uh, put on uh, uh, the recording of uh, Professor Jaffrelot, please, which we did earlier for lot to come on. Thank you, Mr. Boker, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm really sorry not to be able to take part in the panel discussion today, but I'm glad I can at least contribute by um, recording um, some of my views on, on, on the topic uh, that has been chosen. And on this topic, uh, let me first emphasize the fact that Dr. Ambedkar was very right, as usual, uh, when he stressed the importance of constitutional morality because if the Indian constitution is key to Indian democracy, it can be applied in many different ways and distorted. If the rulers do not observe the need virtue. And talking about today's India, I would like to consider how constitutional immorality translate into institutional immorality. You know, the institutions, are so important in any democracy. I'd like to focus on this aspect that as I have um, also um, emphasized in one chapter of my book called um, Modizia. The chapter is entitled Disinstitutionalizing India and it, it analyzes the way a transition from populism to authoritarianism is almost inevitable. You know, we saw that in so many other countries. We saw that also in the past, in the history of India, and during Indira Gandhi in particular, when the leader is considering that his legitimacy comes from the voters, that he has a mandate that can emancipate himself from institutions, then he tends to prevail and he tries to prevail over his party first, but also over institutions of the checks and balances system. And if they resist, it will undermine them. So if you look at all kinds of institutions in India since 2014, you see how this process has uh, worked in the case of the Central Information Commission, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the National Investigation Commission, the Election Commission, and of course, Parliament. Well, I will focus first on the bureaucracy, on, on, on all these commissions whose um, heads are appointed by the government. And there I would say there are three techniques to undermine these institutions. First, they can, there is a, an attempt at diluting their, their power. And, and sometimes even the law, you know, the Right to Information Act is a case in point. The law has been diluted. But you can also weaken these institutions by, by letting post vacant. You know, if you don't appoint anybody as information commissioner, there is no way the applications can be dealt with um, on time. So that's one. Another solution is simply to replace the bureaucrats at the helm by friends, by people who can be co-opted. And interestingly, uh, many senior bureaucrats um, traveled from Gujarat to Delhi um, after 2014. 
the most interesting and telling case possibly there is the case of Alok Verma, the CBI director who has been replaced after a long episode of, of tensions in which the Supreme Court played a role to which I'll return um, by the end of my presentation. I'll look at the judiciary by the end of my presentation. But Alok Verma and the CBI is not the only um, revealing case. Uh, Ashok Lavasa, the former election commissioner, who should have become chief election commissioner, uh, is another interesting revealing uh, case. So that's one way, another way to deal with the um, bureaucracy, to replace Prats by co-opting others who have been sympathetic to the government in the past. Now, there is another institution that has been very much undermined in the recent years, and that is the Indian Parliament. The Indian Parliament is not what it used to be for many different reasons. One of them being that the prime minister does not attend sessions as much as his predecessors. In the book, I give figures showing that all his predecessors, including, of course, Altal Bieri Vajpai, spent more time, much more time, attending parliamentary sessions. But there is something even more important to highlight here in terms of disinstitutionalization of India. And that is the fact that many bills have not been referred to committee, to committees which could be um, able, which would have been able to improve the law in the making, to discuss the bills, and even sometimes, in fact, on many occasions, bills were passed without proper debate on the same day they were, in, they were introduced. And of course, the worst case scenario is the farmers' bills uh, in the Rajya Sabha um, in, in 2019. So that's just a way to illustrate the way another key institution of India's democracy, the parliament, has been undermined. Third, after the bureaucracy and parliament, and I try to be quick, the judiciary. Of course, the case of the judiciary is more complex, but it's such an important institution in the democratic arrangement, architecture of India, that we need to to spend more time on the judiciary and ask why has the Supreme Court of India, that has been one of the most respected body in the world, probably the Supreme Court that had the largest influence in the world, why has this Supreme Court of India lost so much of its prestige over the last few years. Well, again, you find the question of appointments as, as a key question. And, and uh, you may remember that uh, Gopal Subramanium could not be appointed to the Supreme Court in spite of his selection by the Collegium as early as 20, 2014. And appointing the judges, the appointment of the judges was one of the reforms the Modi government introduced in parliament as early as 2014. The way judges were appointed could not be changed precisely because the Supreme Court resisted, but as a result also, dozens of judges could not be appointed either, either at the high court level or um, at the Supreme Court level. 
appointed or promoted uh, as you like that's new that's unprecedented and in fact gopal Suranyam's case was to a certain extent unprecedented you have to go back to uh, indira gandhi's india in the 70s for finding somewhat similar situations so that's one way to undermine the effort of india the appointment process but there is another dimension that needs to be highlighted and uh, i call it in the book what is india the politicization of the judiciary because several judges are today part of the branch of the song parivar that has been created for the lawyers the advikta parishad um, like ak goyal or you are lalit who were part of this organization uh, before joining the supreme court or i've been sympathized sympathizers of um, bgp politicians um, like Arun Mishra, who appeared publicly in the company of BGP leaders. This politicization of the judiciary at the highest level, at the level of the Supreme Court, um, is also uh, rather unprecedented, except if you go back to the 70s, I repeat. Now, there is one more reason why the neutrality of the judges has been affected and that is the way they expect post-retirement jobs. You know, post-retirement jobs were something Arun Jetli considered as immoral. Now we are back to immorality. Well, this is what uh, the BGP government has indulged in. This is what some um, lawyers, justices have indulged it. And of course, uh, the ex-Chief Justice uh, Rajan Gogoi who went to parliament almost immediately after retiring is again a case in point and last but not least prashan bushan argues that some judges have been blackmailed and um, gives details that i have no time to uh, report here but that i analyze in the book and uh, this is an interesting but disturbing development that suggests that the government having a file on everybody, uh, the, the arms of judges also uh, can be twisted. Whatever the reason, whatever the explanation, clearly we've seen a Supreme Court of India not opposing the government of India the way it used to do, either by abstaining to review petitions or by supporting the government. So you may look at uh, the CA, the abolition of Article 370, so many other cases for which a decision is waited from the court, or you look at the election bond or the other um, act, well, in these cases, the Supreme Court uh, approved the government of India uh, decision and after a long time and almost at the last minute. So all these developments affecting the bureaucracy, affecting the parliament, affecting the judiciary go in the same direction, showing that the checks and balances what makes a democracy robust are under attack and i would end by mentioning only briefly one last institution what we call the fourth estate because in this world we have of course a separation of power the executive the legislative the judiciary but we have also for any for, for the democracy to remain vibrant the role of the media and in that case i would first emphasize that there are journalists still resisting active courageous in spite of everything but there are also media outlets the mainstream media as we call it now 
um, victims of uh, intimidation via IT raids, via ED raids, because of petitions of sedition cases against journalists. And uh, the same mechanisms are always in place. The executive can put pressure on the owners of channels for easing out journalists. The way PP Batchpai was sacked by the proprietor of ABP News is a case in point. Uh, but uh, many of them uh, fell in line, have fallen in line. And therefore, there is a real suspicion that the fourth estate is not playing the role it is supposed to play in a democracy because it's not anymore in a position to do so. As a result, uh, in this context, um, clearly, and that's my last word, academics, the intelligentsia, have to be more active on the public scene. And those who are based out of India may possibly be in a position to say more than those who are in the country itself. And this is one of the reasons why uh, some of my colleagues, myself, are certainly looking at politics in India in a different perspective. Uh, some analytical perspective, of course, we are doing our job documenting uh, what we are studying, analyzing, but also with a sense of commitment that is new and that I think is legitimate in such circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jeff Lott. I mean, of course, it's a recording. Now I would uh, invite uh, Professor Suhas Parshikar. You know, Suhas calling another Suhas sounds a little <laughs> interesting. But you are in Pune and I'm in Delhi. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, over to Professor Suhas Parshikar. Thank you, Mr. Borker. Uh, uh, also, thanks to IIC and the Borker Foundation for holding this uh, webinar and inviting me to be part of it. Uh, in a sense, my job has been made easier by the earlier speakers because they have mapped both the legal, juridical, philosophical foundations of what constitutional morality means on the one hand, and in Christoph's case, uh, why constitutional morality is in crisis currently. Uh, let me begin by saying that in any democracy, some attacks on constitutional morality, some shortcomings in the practice of constitution are not unknown. They are quite common in a sense that is part of the way democracy functions. But here, and I would concur with Christoph, what one is facing is not just these cars, these small wounds, these small attacks, but a regular crisis of constitutional morality that we are facing. Whichever way we understand constitutional morality, as Professor Neer Jayal mentioned, uh, the Ambedkarite way or the Deepak Mishra way, we have a crisis that is staring into our face. This crisis may be summed up perhaps what all the speakers have said so far, starting from the question of Raj Dharma to what uh, Christoph was saying, this crisis may be summed up as a double duality. On the one hand, we have the citizenry, which in a sense respects, formally speaking, the constitution, but it is not concerned about what the constitution really stands for. It is not concerned probably with what the constitution really means. In the sense, it is a verbal loyalty to the constitution rather than what Nirja said, saturating the citizenry with constitutional morality. This is one duality. The other duality that we are facing, and that is where Christoph's presentation comes in, is 
that the rulers vouch by the constitution. Nobody is saying let us change the constitution. And that is a curious thing. There were times in the history of India, past seven decades, at least a couple of times, this question of changing the constitution did come about. But today, nobody is talking about changing the constitution. In fact, there has been a ruler who vouches by the constitution. And yet at the same time, the ruling practices, the governance practices are essentially moving away from the constitution, both in its institutional sense and in its moral sense, both. This duality, this double duality may be really described as the crisis of constitutional morality that India faces today. Uh, one may at this point remember the emergency and Mr. Hegley did mention it and I would come back to the emergency later again. This erosion I would call is unprecedented and even compared to the emergency more serious. And that's why I shall come back to the emergency once again later. The question, however, is how do we understand this crisis? Of course, we can critique the crisis. Of course, we can say that we are departing from the dreams of our founding fathers, etc. But what has made this possible is probably also a question which this webinar may deservingly take on board. I would argue that therefore we need to digress a little away from the question of what is constitutional morality and to understand the present moment. Earlier speakers have already come very close to this understanding and I may only be elaborating upon what they have already hinted at. What is the present moment that we are living in? Mr. Hegde used the metaphor of unmuting. Why is it that we are muted? Christoph pointed out the responsibilities that he shoulders because he is outside the country. And some of us here take, run the risk of shouldering the same responsibilities while being in India. What are these responsibilities and what are these risks involved? Why suddenly it has become that a scholar might be running the risk of crossing swords with the powers that be? The answer perhaps is not in the critique, but the answer is in understanding that we are moving away not just from the constitution and the constitutional morality that we are talking about, but we are in fact moving away from the entire spirit that informed the constitution. And that is why I said that I'm in a sense elaborating on what the earlier speaker said, because this is what Mr. Hegde pointed out, that there is a long history and context to the making of the constitution there are many labors that are put into the making of the constitution, but more than all that, there was also a spirit that informed India's nationalism as it shaped during the anti-colonial movement. And we are moving away from that. To put it provocatively, but also probably in a very realistic manner, we are entering into a twilight zone where we are fading from the light that shone on us by the constitution and entering into a new arena, a new political, social and cultural arena. We might call this moment also as the end of the constitutional republic as we have known it so far. Some of you might think that this is an exaggeration, but if you listen carefully to what Christoph listed, chronicled, named, probably the only label to all that can be this, that there is this end of a republic approaching us. We are witnessing this, this transition. That's why I call it the twilight zone, that we are moving away from 
that republic into something unknown or something that we can guess from what is happening around us does this mean that we will have a new constitution i don't think we need to in a sense speculate on that question because the answer which earlier speakers have already given is very clear which is that the present ruling class does not require a new constitution if there is no constitutional morality once you take away the constitutional morality then what remains is merely a structure of dominance that the rulers can use to run the country and infuse in it new ideas of public morality the conflict that was spoken about earlier between the so called constitutional morality and the so called popular morality would then be at the center of the new politics that would open up that is already unfolding around us we therefore need to carefully remember the trajectory because although christoph said that this is from 2014 happening and he is right that it has sort of gathered momentum since 2014 there is a history to it and that history in a sense takes us also to the moment of the emergency we cannot forget the emergency because the emergency of 1975 was a moment when there was a clear sabotage of the constitution and of constitutional morality i would nevertheless make a distinction between that moment and the present moment on one count and that is during the emergency itself it was called out as sabotage it was called out and understood as an attack on democracy when people understand that taking away constitutional morality or erosion of constitutional morality is an attack on democracy probably democracy has at least some possibility of security and securing itself that is what happened quickly in the post emergency period in today's india it's not just that constitutional morality has been dried away drained away from our political practices but that we are generally very unaware or unprepared to accept what is happening there are small voices there are people but the polity in general is not aware of this fact that actually what is happening is the end of the republic i think that this is in fact the most critical difference between today's moment and the earlier moment of crisis of constitutional morality the emergency was important and is important for any student of indian politics as much as a moment of crisis as also a moment of recognizing that there was a crisis today we are in a position we have put ourselves in a position our polity has created a position where we don't want to address the situation by calling it out by naming it by realizing that there is a real crisis at hand so the lesson from the emergency was precisely this that a crisis of constitutional morality leads to a crisis of democracy and therefore it must be called out as such it's not a technical question of jurisprudence it's not a technical question of constitutional interpretation it's a question of life and death of democracy let me come back to the last point then which is that this present crisis started unfolding almost or exactly in fact 3 decades ago in the 1990s it was in the 1990s when we started opening up the flood gates to this question of what the gap between constitution and the constitutional morality can be and that 
In a sense, the 1992 December event is the landmark event as far as the current crisis of constitutional morality is concerned. Because all systems, it was not just one political party challenging, but all systems failing on a certain occasion and resulting into the breakdown of the constitution at the all India level or at the union government's level. That is what happened. What happened in 1992 and post-92 was also that critics of 1992 December event, the destruction of Babri Mosque, they failed to understand and mobilize that this was a crisis of democracy. And since then, gradually, step by step, the public mind has been saturated by not constitutional morality, but a certain alternative idea of morality that currently dominates. Nirja rightly mentioned this as a majoritarian turn. It is this majoritarian turn which now marks our polity, our society, and our culture. When that happens, then the question is not merely of constitutional morality, but also of what kind of democracy India would remain as it celebrates 75 years of independence. In a way, therefore, I am arguing that trying to understand the trajectory of our current crisis, explaining constitutional crisis of constitutional morality at the present moment, is in a sense understanding that there is a majoritarian turn to our politics and our cultural mindset since the 1990s, which has really been the root cause in understanding and in shaping the current crisis that we witness and experience at the moment. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. Parshikar, I think it's been a very incisive contribution from you. And uh, you've talked of uh, double duality and the crisis of constitutional morality and the trajectory it is taking. And then the, the, the final question which you have put is what kind of democracy would uh, you know, remain in India if the, this trajectory is followed? Now, uh, at that point, uh, you know, we didn't have participants. So I had put those put two questions uh, to uh, Christoph. Now I would like those uh, questions to be put and his answers. And if that we can then put to uh, the panel and uh, then we can take up the other questions which are coming up. So can we have that, uh, the questions we put up to Christoph, please? Uh, okay. Uh, Professor Jeffelot, um, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, the recent uh, call for genocide against Muslims. This was at a, uh, at a gathering in Hardwar. Now, you see, there's been, uh, this is, uh, I think, reflects uh, constitution immorality, you know, at the height. Because uh, you have uh, the central government, the state government, and the Supreme Court even not acting against those uh, criminals, you know, they're criminals. Because under the genocide uh, convention, even calling for a genocide is uh, like a genocide, you see. So this is very dangerous for our democracy. No, oh, definitely. In fact, uh, if we want to be complete in this uh, study of um, constitutional immorality, the way minorities are, are dealt with is, of course, uh, contrary to the constitution and and you don't need to to refer to the word secularism you know secularism certainly is in the constitution but the values of human rights at large are also very much uh, in this uh, list of fundamental rights that prefaces uh, the constitution of india so of course any kind of discrimination and we are back to Dr. Edgar, because he was very much behind the listing of 
uh, all forms of discrimination in the constitution of India. Any kind of discrimination on based on caste, religion, race, gender is against the constitution of India. And the way minorities, Muslims, Christians uh, are dealt with is against the constitution. And that's why, that's why you do not need a text only. You need the, you need the morality, the commitment for observing what the text says, because the text can be just non-applied. And uh, the Constitution of India may become redundant if at the text nobody refers to it anymore. Now, uh, but do, do, you, uh, do you find uh, uh, that there is uh, hope in the future for Indian democracy? Of course, there is always hope in the future. The point of no return is not reached yet. When you see so much mobilization, so many civil society movements, not only the anti-CA movement, but the um, farmers movement, you see that uh, there is definitely a commitment to the values of democracy in terms of liberty, equality, dignity, and that continues to, to, to be very much there at the earth of, of society. Now, how does that conver con convert into political change? This is certainly uh, the key question. And, and the, uh, the context is, is, not, is not conducive to this kind of transition when the media, I have mentioned them, are indulging in so much disinformation, when also the, the rule of the game, you know, the electoral rule of the game uh, results in the making of an uneven playing field. You know, the electoral competition is not what it used to be anymore. Uh, when you look at uh, the financial means of the ruling party compared to others, for instance, you see a big asymmetry. If you go by the most convincing estimate, BGP spent 3.6 billion in the 2019 elections. So politically, you have this huge challenge for opposition forces. And last but not least, they have not come together yet. So divisions within the opposition, weaknesses, all kinds of weaknesses of the opposition uh, are one more uh, issues. You know, in, in, in Israel, it took 15 years 15 years to the opponents of uh, Netanyahu to join hands. Uh, in Turkey, uh, the opponents to Erdogan are gradually joining hands after also 15 years. So it's not as if it's easy for opponents to populist leaders to find the alternative, to create the alternative. And, and largely because of the resources I have mentioned, but also because of the saturation of the public space by uh, one-sided messages and information. But no, I don't think that we have reached a point of no return when you have no hope. Certainly not. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I open this discussion? to the panel, uh, first uh, taking up that, uh, that hate uh, uh, speech, you know, in Hardwar, and then uh, uh, the, uh, the 76 uh, eminent lawyers writing to the Supreme Court to take up the case and yet no action. Uh, Professor Jayar? Yes.
Okay. Can you uh, unmute? Uh, I, I have done yeah. twice. I hope, okay. yeah. stay, I hope I will stay yeah. unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. No, sure. you're absolutely right. I mean, this is extremely disturbing. And, uh, but it's not surprising altogether. It just is, um, uh, it, there's been an ex acceleration over the last few years uh, in the nature uh, and, and the frequency of this kind of incident. Uh, elements like these are being emboldened and they've been emboldened by the fact that there, there is practically an assumption of impunity. And that assumption of impunity is never belied. So the impunity that is on offer actually emboldens such people. And, uh, you know, and I think it's supportive of a general ecosystem of, of hate, which, uh, uh, which presumably um, uh, coheres with a certain political agenda. Uh, Sanjay? Can you unmute, please? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, yeah. just to be, uh, to set the record straight, the lawyers wrote a letter to the Chief Justice saying that this is unprecedented and also that there are already matters which are pending in the Supreme Court about hate speech, which need to, which need to be further processed. The Chief Justice has not, uh, at least there is no public record of the Chief Justice having uh, listed those matters or not listed those matters. But quite apart from that, what, uh, uh, and uh, this also talks to Professor Palshikar's uh, uh, question about the twilight of the Republic. What sometimes gives me great hope is India's young. There has simultaneously with liberalization and with the, with the decline in fertility rates, you have a large middle-class India which has emerged. Many of them have, uh, it's, a, it's a curious coincidence, but there has been a decline of uh, people going to engineering colleges and there's been an upswing on people going to law colleges. And there has been an insistence among the younger lawyers of bringing people to account legally. I'll just give you a, a, a one or two instances. You, you saw that uh, Bully Buys app recently. It was when people said, no, let's not rush to the co uh, Supreme Court. The Supreme Court may or may not hear us, but let us instigate a particular police station or the other that everybody had to compete to say that, look, we are a court, we are filing, uh, we, we are uh, working according to the constitution. And it's only when the Bombay police started that the Delhi police had to fall in line. There has been a recent uh, order of the Supreme Court in a case which I appear and I don't want to either take credit or argue it, but briefly, uh, inspector of police in Bulan Shahar, Uttar Pradesh, was lynched in uniform when he was trying to maintain law and order in the context of a huge ijtama procession of the Muslims. And there were the cow vigilantes who said that some, uh, something untoward was happening. And the vigilantes went ahead and actually killed the inspector. It was treated as a normal proceeding before the Allahabad High Court. And after some time, the man got bail. The man's widow came to the Supreme Court, challenged the bail, and the Supreme Court recently has directed him to surrender. And it, it will probably look to putting that case back on track. Consequence, even if the system is slow, archaic, refuses to move, there have been, there have been numerous attempts to get it to move. I can only hope that uh, younger India is much more um, cognizant of democratic values and constitutional morality. Uh, just, just one last example I'd like to give was during the CAA protests, uh, people were being arrested and all that, and people moved various courts. Rarely did they get immediate relief. But it was a young magistrate in Delhi, who in an incident in Daryaga, who stepped in and said, you have to follow the law. How can, how can you arrest them? So right. yes, I, I, I do place great uh, emphasis on the young and I hope uh, Professor Palshikar that we are not seeing 
the end of the Republic. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Paul Shikhar, on that hate uh, speeches and no action. Especially about that Hardwar incident, which is uh, was blatantly calling for genocide. I think three quick points about that. I don't disagree at all with what has been already said on that. That the uh, judiciary could take cognizance of it. But more importantly, it's a matter that the governments, both at the center and the state, should have taken note of, which they are unlikely to do for obvious political reasons. The third point, therefore, is are we scandalized by this as a society? And I'm, I'm afraid that barring small pockets, we are not really scandalized by this idea. It's not a question whether Hindus are saying so about Muslims and so on. It's simply a question of one group publicly calling for killing of another group of citizens. And we are not scandalized because this idea that there is a division of the citizenry between the Hindus and the Muslims or the majority and the non-majority has sort of crystallized now. And I think that's, that's where my fears really arise from. So I'll stop here with only this much. Now, there, you see, there is a, a question from uh, Danish uh, Ahmad. He's joining us from... Australia, Dr. Danish uh, Ahmed. Now, he, he was mentioning about this hate speech. I think we've already taken that up and then about rebuilding secularism in India. I mean, but I think we will take what uh, uh, Professor Balvi Arora has now put across to us. There are two things. Uh, one, he uh, has addressed it to Professor Jayal. Professor Jayal referred to powerful minorities holding Republican institutions hostage. I think there's some uh, uh, there's some uh, uh, kind of a miss uh, on that. Uh, Professor Jayal, could she please elaborate from where does the danger to free institutions emanate? Is it from within the institutional structure? Right. Uh, so, uh, Professor Arora, um, uh, the I was you know quoting George Grote there. Uh, it is his view. It was his view that you need the diffusion of constitutional morality in the entire citizenry. Otherwise, his fear was that what he called powerful and obstinate minorities could make free government uh, impracticable. And uh, Dr. Ambedkar quotes this. Uh, my point was actually in opposition to this, saying that what happens when the danger to free institutions is actually emanating from powerful and aggressive majorities rather than from powerful and obstinate minorities. So, um, yeah, just to clarify that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is another, uh, another question uh, to, uh, 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 from uh, Professor Balbir Arora, now addressed to Professor Palshikar. Uh, Professor Palshikar mentioned that there is no move to amend or change the constitution. Is it because the constitution has ceased to pose an obstacle to majoritarian agenda and lip service can be paid to it while pursuing the agenda? Yeah, what I meant was that that will not be the main focus for the simple reason that once you have taken away constitutional morality, then it doesn't matter what the structures are because you are anyway not going to be bound by those structures uh, morally and legally if you are bound by them, you can circumvent that because as we have already seen, there are institutions which easily fall prey to the powerful. Once that happens, then you don't need that. So I'm not saying that it will not happen or there are no moves because both abrogation of Article 370 or the CAA were fundamentally amendments to the idea of what the Indian constitution is. So I'm not saying that. Okay. There is a question now which actually links up with what Sanjay said earlier about uh, you know the, the younger generation standing up. So this is, uh, this is from Mahendra Kumawat. Hasn't the Indian education system generally failed to inculcate constitutional morality in the students of India who are currently manning different important institutions of India? You see, this also links up with the, uh, the, uh, the National Security Advisor Doval's speech 
to uh, the probationers, you know, the, the, the passing out from the Sadar Patel uh, Police Academy in Hyderabad. That, you know, you now you have to look at the civil society because they are uh, engineering problems. So, I mean, you know, there, there is a there's a kind of what uh, Parshikar, uh, Professor Parshikar mentioned about this, uh, you know, this emerging uh, double duality, you know. I mean, that is coming through, right through. So, can the education system, I mean, under the present dispensation, create a niche for constitutional morality? Uh, Sanjay? Well, I hope that the present system does not do it. The present dispensation, if it was to define constitutional morality, God help us. Mm. But was there a problem earlier? See, we did have a civic sense drilled into us in our civics classes. I do remember that uh, we had something called a national pledge, which was there on every textbook, which said, India is my country. All Indians are my brothers and sisters. That still stays with me. But at the end of the day, those are words. Why are those words there? Why do you need to stay together and be bound by a constitution and its morality? That, I think, has never been adequately explained. And I doubt, I really doubt that any government will do a good enough job of it. And that is where, uh, drawing on uh, Professor Jayal, uh, Ambedkar, Groot, everyone, when you have to infuse the citizenry, and I'm only reminded of uh, an old interview where uh, Zora Segal once squarely put the blame for communalism on the Indian mother. He says, ye sab ma se shuru hota hai. Jab ma kehti hai, usse mat khel, wo ye hai, ya wo hai. Sab se shuru hota hai. As a citizenry, I think we are now duty bound to tell anyone, when we have, we all have our WhatsApp uncles and uh, friends and acquaintances from long ago who just uh, blurt out anything that the IT cell comes out with. You have to stand up and say, look, you're wrong. This is not part of the conversation here. This is not civilized conversation. And if it continues, they, there will be a breakdown. It is that very particular insistence on decency norms and fraternity norms in our private exchanges which will go on to build the fraternity that Ambedkar talked about. I am uh, reminded of, uh, you know, the incident in Martin Luther King's life when he was yeah, yeah, very young, he was a kid, and uh, there was this white mother who asked the white kid of hers to not play with this black boy. So this black uh, uh, boy, that is Martin Luther King, goes up to his mother and questions the whole thing. Why is this happening? And you know, that is the germ, that, that is the start of that entire, if one would say that, uh, his focus shifts to the, the demanding his civil rights and then the civil rights movement and you know, what have you. So, I mean, that is true that uh, the civil society has to wake up to this uh, hate mongering and uh, put an end to it. Now, the last, uh, uh, if we could just uh, take one round, the last round, um, do you see hope for Indian democracy in the future, uh, Professor Palshikar? I mean, what we have discussed now, and do you are you optimist? Op, are you optimistic that this is just an aberration and it will just pass, and we have to wait for that thing to pass? You know, it's it's tough to answer your question quickly in yes and no, but I would say that I'm rather pessimistic <coughs> because our inner capacity to sustain repression has probably uh, eroded considerably. Uh, and our institutional capacity to withstand such assaults institutionally has also co been corroded considerably. At least in the short run, therefore, we are going to have probably, though uh, Mr. Hegde didn't agree with the word, uh, a twilight period. I don't know whether that twilight period will continue for long, whether there will be a dawn, 
or whether there would be a dark. Okay. Uh, uh, Sanjay? Well, uh, reverting to Faiz, Dil na umid na sahi na kaam hi to hai. Lambi hai gam ki sham, par sham hi to hai. Very good. That sums it up. Okay, uh, uh, Professor Jayal? Oh, I, I don't think I can, no, it said that I have to wait for the host to unmute me. I do, after what Mr. Hegde just said, I think anything I say would be very uh, banal. But, uh, but, uh, but you know, I, I do agree with uh, Suhas Palchikar that um, in the short term, this is looking difficult, uh, not least because in this, so, I mean, it's possible that you can think, you know, if you think only about electoral politics as being the route to change, uh, that is not impossible, but the, and that could even lead to a process of institutional retrieval and recovery, uh, you know, if one is very optimistic, which I personally am not. But, but, but the toxicity in our society, the normalization of hate and violence, that is of another order. That I don't think we have experienced before. So has made a comparison with an earlier phase in our uh, democracy when we had a crisis, but I don't think this particular element was there. And this is the worry because the, the propaganda machine, the disinformation machine, the fake news and all of that, which is, and the, the social media, and you know, we've been reading um, uh, you know, major investigations lately on this, all of that is, is, has capitalized on some probably deep-seated prejudice that Mr. Naresh Saxena has put into the, into the chat box and, or into the Q&A box, um, which, which is very hard to, to get rid of. So we may be able to have changes of government, but we can actually change the way people think, um, uh, you know, in the short term seems very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jayal, uh, Professor Palshikar, uh, Sanjay, and uh, in absentia to Christoph for joining us from Paris. Uh, but, you know, the, the point is that I, I am a diehard optimist and I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, we shall, we shall overcome. I mean, the emergency was a short period. This is an undeclared emergency. So we, we don't know where to begin and where it led. But I think uh, I uh, sincerely feel that we shall overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.